So did you always want to work in museums? No, I didn't. Um, I always liked to go to museums. It was the thing that my parents would talk about all the time, that um, huh. when, I was a, when I was a kid, I would always ask to go to museums when we were traveling. Um, huh. And they actually found that behavior somewhat odd. And, but I didn't really think about I didn't really think about it as a I didn't really think about it as a job I think until after I graduated college. Huh. So what did you study in college? So I studied a couple of things. I I, um, I started my studies in college um, as a physics major because because growing really? up you know, growing up when I growing up when I grew up um, I won't you know. Well, the little boys wanted to be astronauts before before <laughs> little girls went into space also. And then I suspect maybe some little girls wanted to be astronauts as well. Oh, um, and so that wasn't going to happen because I didn't want to go into the military, which seemed to be the only way to become an astronaut. Huh, and so yeah. I decided that astronomy would be um, an interesting pursuit. And I was um, I was an active amateur astronomer in, in, um, in junior high school and high school, which which didn't put me in it in necessarily a very very good social group but it gave me something to do what, what's your no because you're up at night because <laughs> you're up at way. night and, and it's really not a kind of thing that you can you know it's not the sort of you know i didn't race cars or or or, or, do, or play sports so it wasn't that kind of thing so um, what's people your didn't favorite, quite understand uh, what's your favorite yes? night sky uh um constellation or star so my two favorite objects are both in the constellation Orion, the the um, so the Orion Nebula and the Horsehead Nebula were the really? were my two favorite objects. I've I've added a um, there's a double star Alberio in in, um, in um, Cygnus, which I've added because it's um, the two stars are that are my children's favorite colors, yellow and and yellow and blue. My son's favorite color is yellow, and my daughter's is blue. Oh, nice! I, I have a little bit of a story also. My favorite. Uh, would you call it a, an object? Uh, I, yeah. My husband used to have a. We used to go out and look at the stars, and I think my very favorite thing was M13, the globular cluster, which looked to me like um, uh, a bunch of pearls in black ink, and I always thought yeah. it was just so beautiful. And then um, came to New York and found there was a gallery that was called M13. And it had to do with a bus route, <laughs> so it was kind of <laughs> the bus route. So that didn't so that didn't work out. No. Did you always want to work in museums? Um, no, as a kid, my I was uh, taken to museums a lot. Um, my mother was an artist of uh, an amateur artist, I must say, and she used to take me to the Art Institute in Chicago. We we lived in a suburb of Chicago, and we'd take the Illinois Central train up, and that was in the day when the chairs were wicker, the seats were wicker, and they'd flip back and forth depending upon which direction you were headed. But um, I remember the cafe or the cafeteria, uh, and I always got an ice cream as a reward for going with her. <laughs> That's the part I remember the most from being a kid. But no, um, I think my first interest was when I was in school at the University of Wisconsin and I worked in a slide library as a work study student and um, and the slide library in there was very interested in computerization and cataloging and all that so I got my first taste of that um, working there and that was really wonderful just so I got to put the cat out he's really <laughs> So, um, yeah, um, one thing led to another. And uh, when I was in grad school working on this textile collection, that was my first MCN meeting. We went to, we went to um, Rochester to present our optical laser disc project. And that was uh, 19, what did I say? Well, I told you in an email. I think it was 84, 80, 83 or 84. Right. And I think you went, 83. I think it, and yours was in 84 in Ottawa, you said. Mine was in eighty four. I think mine was in eighty. Mine was in eighty four, but I think it was in New Orleans. I think my oh, first really? one was in New Orleans. <clears throat> huh. um, well. And maybe it was earlier than that. I, I remember. I went. There was a. Um, there, there was a curator. So I was working at the Museum of Natural History already at the time, uh -huh. and yeah. also they were um, looking into different ways to computerize. They were doing a um, collection inventory prep for a move, 
and that's how I got hired. And um, and there was an idea to, to do some to computerize the records and, and to think about um, doing some digital imaging. And there was a um, there was a curator in one of the other departments. I can't remember what his, what the department was anymore. But he had worked early on like Seljum and some of those very early um, wow. museum projects, and, uh-huh. um, and suggested that I go to um, suggested that I go to a museum computer network meeting. And 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 I'm yeah. pretty sure, I think it was in I think the first one was in New Orleans. That's how I remember it. But that would have been, you know, 84-ish, 85-ish, and maybe yeah. I don't remember so well anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember in grad school, no, it was, I was an undergrad, and I used to, I took a computer in the arts class, and there was a cold room where the computers were, and we had these horrible little monitors, and I'd try to program stuff, and it was just painful, and I realized it was 10 o'clock at night all of a sudden, and my husband was home wondering where I was. He had the kids, you know, and um, it just the time just flew by just trying to get this program right, and it was punch cards. And for years afterwards, um, the punch cards used were used for shopping lists. They were just wonderful. Did you Did you work with punch cards at all? Yes. So after I um, so I did my undergraduate degree, I finished my undergraduate degree actually in anthropology. So I gave up on the um, I gave up on the physics and astronomy because of math, which is which, <laughs> which always makes people laugh because I wound up in computer science. Um, yeah. But it was but it was a different kind of math. And um, so then I so history and anthropology were also um, things that had interest me. So it's, so I switched majors and I and I. Um, graduated with an anthropology sociology degree, and oh. when I was working at Natural History, um, again, like I said, so they were looking for, they were looking to computerize records, and they had just gotten a uh, Wang VS system, oh. and so, and I had some, I had taken some classes in high school, I had taken some classes in college, and so I, you know, I sat myself down in front of it and learned how to program in COBOL, because that was the oh, wow. that was the programming language that it had, and yeah. so, and then the um, Museum had a program that um, they would pay for school, so they said that if I wanted to go and um, and study computer science, that they would pay for my tuition. Yeah, great. So so in, in um, so I did that at community college, Rockland Community College in New York, uh-huh. and um, and so one of the languages you had to learn was assembler, and the assembler language was still uh-huh. taught on an old IBM mainframe with punch cards. Wow. So I learned how to program an assembler on on punch cards. Huh. My my first experience, and, and I had taken, as an art student, I had taken a class called Computer in the Arts, and I remember working on uh, a Mac, uh, a very early Mac. We actually had at home a, um, an Apple II Plus, which had two disk drives with five and a quarter inch floppies, and you'd, you'd take the floppies out, and there was, I think it had 65K of memory in the, in the computer itself, but I, I was writing little programs for animation by 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 flip uh, screen um, capability that the Mac had at that time. And um, so I took this class called Computer in the Arts, and my textile uh, printing teacher found out about it. She said, oh, wouldn't you like to write a program for for the um, textile collection, which was like 20,000 pieces, and they had card catalogs. And I thought, oh, this is this would be fun. So I was working out with, um, on a, a, a VAX mainframe in something... Um, no, it was a deck mainframe with a in a program called Vax, I think it was, and it was um, a flat file program, and it was really easy to, to do, um, and um, that's how we started out with the Helen Allen textile collection, um, getting the entire collection online, so to speak, and we had a um, uh, a green screen which had all the data, and then. We had um, also photographed every single textile in the collection, which took a year and a half. And we did it on 16 millimeter film, which was then edited on a UMAX machine. And uh, the, di- the, the disc was pressed, and each of the images had a screen, had a number. Um, I guess it was a file number, but, but the, um, the file number was then transferred to the database. And whenever you pulled up a particular artwork uh, or a particular textile, the, uh, the the screen number would also pull up, and then on a color monitor right next to it, the image would pop up. So that was way back in the early days. I think I still actually have the video disc someplace, and it was a, 
wonderful project. It was a graduate uh, project, a curatorial project assistantship that I had for three years, and it was um, really wonderful. But that's how I started out. But to, but programming on a mainframe computer for a flat file database seems absolutely ludicrous these days. Yes. So where, <laughs> from there. <laughs> From there, yeah. Ludic- from there, where did you go? So it seemed somewhat ludicrous well, I, then as well. But. Well, well, I was working on the on the uh, in the graduate program there. Um, I got a master's degree in library and information studies while I was also working on my art history master's. So I had the background, and then getting a job was frankly very easy because I was more or less uh, savvy with respect to computerization, with cataloging, with library acquisitions, um, and my first job was at Kenyon College as the AV librarian, and I introduced uh, optical laser disc to them, I organized their slide collection, I computerized it, and I, and I, I was mindful of copyright at the time, so I became pretty much engaged, and then my husband couldn't get a job anywhere near Kenyon College, so I started applying for jobs and wound up at the Detroit Institute of Arts as the collection manager. And uh, the computerization stuff came in handy there because they had something called DARIS, the Detroit Art Registration Information System, which was a statewide network, which was failing as a statewide network because it too was a flat file database. And so I um, launched a program to um, do an RFP and assess the various um, collection management systems that were out there, and we settled on TMS. And then it took off from there. And from there, did you go? Where did you go from there? Or did you? From Detroit, there. the Institute of Art. Yeah. I was there for about seven years, and um, I dismantled the statewide network because nobody was actually using it. With TMS, and um, then um, I thought, well, let's take a look around for jobs, and I um, I was hired at the Guggenheim Museum as the head registrar there, and. Uh, I brought in TMS there also. Um, it was, again, an RFP situation, and um, I met a lot of great people there. Um, and uh, the IT staff was wonderful. And um, from there, I went to the Whitney as the head registrar there. And I had learned that um, they had put, they, had, they were the only museum that bought Darius because they were, they were also trying to you know, market it out. They bought Darius and they put it out. Jim Mesa put it out on the sidewalk, the mainframe, uh, well, well before um, um, Detroit had. And then they had no computer system, as I recall, um, maybe just a couple of standalone computers. And then we also um, implemented TMS there. And um, so that was... That was an interesting process. Um, it was did not. I don't think we did an RFP, but we just realized that this is probably the best system for us at the time. And um, yeah, now I use Embark, and I've been on my own. I, I left the Whitney and started my own business, and um, now I use Embark, which is also a gallery systems product for all of my clients. So that's the short version. <laughs> You had a more well, complicated trajectory than I did. You were well, a little bit more. You know, going from from astronautics to um, head of IT at Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, that's a stretch. <laughs> that's a big stretch. It is a bit of a stretch, but I but I did it in I did it with without a lot of um, I did it without a lot of moves. So I went from so I went from my undergraduate degree to the Museum of Natural History and to the Anthropology yeah. Department. And so, and like I said, I worked on, on a, it was a Mellon grant, actually. A bunch of people were hired oh. to do inventory of the collection and, and re-storage. So it was, um, it's interesting that, because all that work is still happening in, in a lot of places, but so, oh, yeah. you know, um, creating, creating more state-of-the-art storage for the ethnographic collections than, than were available at that time. So a large-scale move of, of, I was hired at the beginning of a project to move the African ethnographic collection. And so we were doing inventory on um, um, cards, you know, five by five by six writing it all down and so and as I said there was a, there was there was an idea that maybe there was a better way to do that and so yeah. 
And so we tried to get that up and running. Um, the museum purchased a, um, a Wang system, and everybody got, all the departments got one terminal in, in their main office. And it had a, um, and it had a system that actually um, was an application generator. So you can, you can design screens, and then it would actually build the code um, behind that in COBOL. And then you could edit, and then you can, um, once that happened, if you wanted to, you could edit the code behind there um, if you wanted to add functionality. But it gave you some yeah. basic database um, and data entry functions um, without with doing nothing other than, than designing screens. And so we did that as a, as a pilot for, um, for those ethnographic records. Um, but the institution wasn't, going to, wasn't expanding that system um, significantly, and so we moved it off to... Um, to some PC-based systems, and so we use some some sort of consumer, um, prosumer um, databases of the time. So um, we use DBase, we use Focus, we used FoxPro, you know, all that all that stuff right. that was happening around then. And so I wrote, um, and at that time I was also beginning my studies. So I wrote some programs in each of those to to create a um, collections management system. In that, we also started a um, an imaging project right around the early 90s, like 93. So we, we wrote a grant to the NEH um, and got funded for doing digital imaging. At that point, we had moved to the Northwest Coast Ethnographic Collection. Oh, and so we, started, um, so we started photography of that. Um, uh -huh. Similarly to, to how yours reacted, except the, um, there were digital files, but we had to do, this, we had to do a similar kind of, of, of display because the mm -hmm. displays, the primary displays were, were graphic oriented. And so we would see this it was also a green screen. We would see the object information. And then if you clicked on it, if you clicked on a portion of the record, it would actually change the display to a graphics display and the image would, um, and the image would show. Um, oh. There was this crazy um, um, consultant that we had in New York that <laughs> built this sort of octopus looking um, device in the back that was actually triggered through the serial port to make the, um, to make the monitor um, display change from graphics to text and back uh, huh. with a very nice audible click cause at, at that point. And then, um, and then we just moved on with that. We got, a, um, we got a little bit better, so we got a SQL server. Um, we actually got money to, to, to create a server and a network. Um, and migrated uh, migrated that database to a SQL database, and I, I managed a programmer to to update what I had written um, to work in there. And then um, I had so it's also personal in the same way that you had. So I had um, by that time um, I was married, and I had a daughter who actually seemed to be allergic to New York, um, <laughs> actual, actually physically allergic to New York. So and I didn't really want to live. I didn't want to commute into New York, and I'd been to I've been at the museum for about 15 years, and it seemed like mm -hmm. even for me time for a change. So, mm -hmm. so, and I think actually I called a bunch of people. You were one of them, I think, yeah. Yeah. about whether you know if you knew of any other jobs. And I think you were the one that told me that Gail Harity had um, had just started down here at Philadelphia and and was mm -hmm. looking for um, looking for a replacement for Bob Lemming, and yeah. I should send her my resume. You did, and, uh, <laughs> and I did, and um, and and sh and she liked it enough to hire me, and so I've been here for twenty years. Um, twenty years, really? Yeah, I guess yeah. that's about right. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and then also, so that you know, the jobs. So for me, in the institutions, the jobs change. There's a there's a cycle of about every five years that that major things come through, major projects change. So I started here. Um, one of the things that I started here because they, they had gotten a grant 10 years before I got here to do um, a collections um, a collections information um, RFP. And mm -hmm. there'd been some work towards it, but um, a lot of other things had happened and nobody had ever really sort of put their shoulder to it and created the RFP and done the selection process. And so, since I had gone through that a couple of different times at Natural History, um, mm -hmm. it was one of, the, one of the reasons that I got this job. So, so one of the first things I did here was to was to organize that work and to get a um, and we actually chose to CMS also but to get that process going and to oh. get a um, a collections information system in and then there was there's been construction here so I learned a lot about um, I learned a lot more about networks than I knew when I got here I learned a lot more about business systems because this job also um, also dealt with all computerization so I learned about ticketing systems and finance oh, wow. systems and, and we had um, technical control over the website, so I learned I learned a lot about that. And so every, like I said, every five years, there was a major change 
in the structure of, of my department and the, and the technology needs of the institution. So, and just recently in 2013, we just reorganized again to include a section of the department that focuses specifically on interactive technologies. Oh, really? Hmm. What are interactive technologies there? Um, so what are they or what, do, what did we make? Yes. Both. <laughs> um, so we consider them, basically what we consider them as everything that's forward facing. So anything that we do in galleries, anything we do in, in, um, if we do mobile apps. And, and it was a way to kind of put an umbrella over, over the website as well. So, so we, manage, we manage that technology um, as, far as, as far as the public facing technology goes. Um, except for things like social media and, and other things are, are still managed directly through the marketing department, uh, but we manage the rest. Um, so we've done some nice in-gallery um, kiosks. We've done um, a couple of things. We did a, um, an exhibit of furniture um, from our, from our um, American furniture collection, and it was essentially an environmental space. So. Yeah. The idea was is that we would show the, what the furniture looked like. It was, it was a small um, period room, um, but we decided that people should understand you know, that, that these things look different at different times of day and in, with inside lighting and outside lighting. So we actually created a system of um, lighting that, was, or that, was, um, that ran on a cycle, but you can also change it from an iPad that showed the room at different stages during the day. So it showed it in the morning with sunlight streaming in, showed it in the oh, evening with, yeah. um, with what gas light would look like in the room, and oh. showed how the furniture and, and the objects in the, in the room changed and, and um, kind of morphed the room um, based on, on light. That sounds, that sounds really nice. Really it was. Nice. It was really. It was. It was very interesting. It was really interesting to see um, the connection that people had when, because the room was actually, because the room changed, and 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 some yeah. degree, I think, especially those kinds of things are very static, and so and to see that, I think that just the changing of the light in the room gave people a little bit more time to kind of think about um, that it was a room and think about how rooms are used, and think about how furniture and decorative arts in rooms are are used just by making mm -hmm. that sort of um, visual change. I think it gave people a little bit better sense of, of why those pieces were there and what we were trying to convey with the exhibit. And then we've when done some... The, okay. What's the question? When was this exhibit? Um, that was about probably about 18 months ago, two years ago, 18 months so ago. So are you planning to use that type of technology in, in other um, exhibitions coming up? So we so it was actually the technology that we had was um, some of the theatrical lighting technology that we had actually came from um, an exhibit that we a temporary exhibition that we had done um, surrounding surrounding some works um, by Duchamp. Basically, the um, we did a, a sort of a large scale performance piece surrounding the um, the large glass, uh -huh. and one of the things that happened during that there was a there had been a dance that was commissioned. Um, at the same time that that work was created by Duchamp, there was a dance that had been commissioned to um, to also um, sort of dancing the themes of the work. And so we had dancers come in to perform that periodically in the exhibition space. And so we had acquired a, um, a large-scale theatrical lighting um, controller in order to do that work. And so one of the reasons that our AV staff had an idea of to try to do this lighting piece um, when the curator was talking about wanting to do it, is that we actually already had the um, the equipment to do that work. That's that's amazing. That's that. Have you presented that at MCN? We have not presented that at MCN. No. That sounds really interesting. And, and I was watching the MCN listserv, and there's the the um, discussion there about um, AV and where it falls within the. Within the, within the museum, whether it's part of um, exhibitions or part of IT, um, and, and, and as I understand, it's more of a collaborative effort there, or does, does AV report to you? So, so AV reports to AV reports to me, um, or AV actually. So right now, AV sits. We're divided into three large groups, and so AV sort of sits in the in the systems space on our end. Um, huh. Largely, be, mostly what our AV department does, um, although I would like them to be able to do more of this kind of creative work, they, they do a lot of, of event support. So we have a large um, special events program, and they do also a lot of meeting support. 
And so right. our AV staff is, is, although obviously they have technical skills and creative skills to do other things, they are they're primarily tasked to, to do these large scale um, large scale meeting support that we do. So that's how they wound up where they are for us. But I think it is um, it's an interesting problem because because there's there's the creative um, part of AV, the production part of AV that um, that I think many institutions don't necessarily take advantage of. I know we don't do it as well as we probably could um, to take advantage of that skill set for, for our AV staff to do more of this kind of work. Hmm. Um, I see, I'm looking at the sample interview questions and, and one of them is um, um, how do you stay up to date with your tech skills? And, and I think more importantly, I'd, I'd kind of like to ask you, and this is from a personal um, issue that I have, what, you, what you're feeling about the cloud is. Um, is it safe? Would you use it? Uh, what's the current thinking as far as your understanding goes? Because I've got clients who would like to have their data in the cloud, and I'm really leery about it because what if the cloud company goes out of business and your data is lost? So I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, any? so we so we've both demonstrated that that we've been at this for a little while, right? So, so for me, the the, the cloud is is there's there's cycles in technology. There's there, and so there's a cycle of of pulling everything into a central location, and then mm -hmm. having remote clients um, and other ways to access the information that's in a central location, and then there's the decentralized model that 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 sort of came with the beginning of personal computers, where every all your information is local, and you find ways to share from your from your local from your local piece, mm -hmm. and so so the cloud for me is just, it's just another iteration of of, of of sort of remote centralized storage and 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 um, and data manipulation, and so right. so the thing about it is when I talk to people about it, um, those issues that you just mentioned don't go away. So you still have to make sure that you protect your data. You, so you, so you have to be mindful about who you pick to store your data. You 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 have to be mindful about what you do to to back it up. So you don't use the backup. Probably don't want to use the backup of your cloud provider. That's your primary. You probably want to use a different one for for a backup for your data, so that in case of any kind of error, in case of, of catastrophic problem of your provider going out of business, um, to the fact that maybe your provider you know is hit by a virus or or some other right. you know some other problem and and they lose access to your data for a period of time, um, or if you just decide you want to move, to, you know you want to move yeah. your data from one place to another. And it's easier to, to still find ways to primarily hold on. I think to that's your data. great advice. Great advice. Wow. Are you using the cloud for anything? We do. We use it for so we use it for some data storage. Our 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 website has been hosted in that way. So we don't host so certain services. Mm -hmm. um, we don't host. We didn't want to host online on our own because we're not um, we're not a twenty four seven shop. I don't have staff here overnight. Um, in case of a problem, um, right. we don't have the you know we don't have the same kind of redundant facilities. We have some redundant facility, and we get more, but we don't have the same kind of redundant facilities that you can get when you go to a cloud hosting environment. So our our primary website is is hosted in the cloud. Our um, our retail our retail sales site is hosted in the cloud. Our marketing department uses a service, a cloud service, for their um, for the part of the site that they use to communicate with the press. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot of features of instead of building them, there's a lot of things that you can get um, by going to various different um, different software um, cloud software vendors that give you mm -hmm. the functionality that you want quicker, and that we mm -hmm. don't have to maintain them. I would um, we have a, a, a medium sized server room here, and we were mm -hmm. actually just um, we were touring it the other day with some people, and, and you know, I wouldn't mind a lot of the a lot of our servers if they were actually if we pushed them somewhere else. I'd like to get out of the business of okay. managing updates for server hardware and software every you know every few years. It's just it's a drain on us, it's a drain on our resources. Um, okay. It isn't a core competency. Um, there are plenty of places that'll do it better than us, and there's an economy of scale that makes it cheaper for us to buy that service now than, than making it on our own. And then I have staff that I can that I can purpose towards doing things that are more creative and not having to worry about whether or not our you know our our virtual servers are running right. Sounds like a sound long-range planning. Um, just 
just going back to MCN, let's bring MCN into this again. Um, and this is a little bit lighter than the cloud, <laughs> not that the cloud wouldn't be light, but uh, do you have a, a favorite memory <clears throat> from a past MCN conference? And as, this, as these uh, sample questions say, it doesn't need to be a session. It could be a favorite social memory or a funny story. Right. But we were also supposed to. We, t we, we X that out, right? Neither of us wanted to talk about karaoke. So. No, we I have no, I have no karaoke memories. So. No, I. <laughs> so my favorite memory of MCN was MCN in, in Pittsburgh. And I don't remember. I think it was, well, it was the year the um, year that Bill Clinton was running for president the first time. Oh, so, right, right, right. Yeah. And so as it turned out, the, he was addressing a group of, of airline workers. There was, a, um, there was a potential strike. There was something going on, some sort of legislation going on anyway. So he was on a campaign stop in Pittsburgh. And there was a rally close to the hotel that we were at. And so a bunch of us actually walked over and watched him speak. And then as it turned out, when we came back, um, he, was using our, he was using the same hotel that we were using for the meeting. As a base, I think he was there for the rest of the day, and he was at meetings back and forth. There was a number of times that he was walking through the lobby with his various entourage and, and, um, and um, Secret Service staff around him. So they'd set up these rope lines around the around the lobby, and he'd walk by. And so what I remember is is that there was a little bit of a um, every time he walked by, there was an attempt to to shake his hand. And so yeah. it became a bit of a became a bit of a thing. So I wound up shaking Bill Clinton's hand five times that day as he <laughs> moved through <laughs> as he moved through the lobby. And I and there was somebody was keeping track and it actually got posted that um, the um, Spectre, the publication that MCN used to have, um, when the when the meeting notes um, were published in that, there was a list of the of the people who had who had sh um, shook Bill Clinton's hand that day and how many times. And so that was my favorite. That's really wonderful. And, and what, uh, what was the format of Spectra at that time? Do you remember? Um, like the format is so, it was, it was you know, it was, it was a... What did it look like? It was a bunch, it was folded, <laughs> it was looked like hand printed and hand folded um, newsletter that was mailed. Oh. So similar to the kinds of newsletters that I, my astronomy club actually stopped doing a little bit a while ago, but used to do... Um, more embarrassingly longer than you probably should have, which was, you know, four or six pages um, printed and folded and mailed. And that's, uh -huh. that's basically how, that's basically think, how Spectra was. I think I was managing Spectra at the time. And um, once I realized that it was one of those newsletter-y type things, um, my husband and I redesigned it, and it had a new glossy black and white, um, uh, cover. It was actually a, a quarterly journal at that point, but I remember those. And I wonder if I if I didn't um, if I wasn't the editor of Spectre at the time when that came out, because I vaguely vaguely remember the the Bill Clinton stories, but I don't remember that you got the prize for um, shaking his hand more times than anybody else. But that's um, yeah. I, I still have all those old specters. I tried to offer them to um, Mr. Longo, but he said he had them all someplace in the archive, or the archive has them. So I'm, I just have them in a filing cabinet in my basement. <laughs> yeah, I think they're scanned somewhere. I remember oh, vaguely cool. getting. I remember vaguely getting a um, a CD of them at some point. Oh, really? I that's actually funny. went around looking for it. I couldn't find it. So. Well, you're, um, you're welcome to all my old spectres if you'd like. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a, it would be interesting, actually, because um, some of this, back to them saying that some of the meetings, it's some of the things that that we that we're talking about now. Um, again, I guess maybe to that cyclical piece, um, or things that we've been talking about. To me, that seems like it's some issues that that we've been talking about over and over again yeah. for a while. Um, you know, specifically surrounding, still surrounding collections information. Um, I think more than basic information now, still, you know, dealing with image rights issues, still dealing with how to make sure that the things are more easily accessible and what does accessibility mean, who the audience for those things are. It seems that we are, that we're still debating some of the very, very core issues um, that we were debating back then. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, you know, I haven't been to an MCN meeting for many years, but I do follow the um, 
the listserv and find it very interesting to see what the topics of discussion are. And, um, yeah, it's, um, I'm, I'm pleased that this is a 50-year organization. And I'm going to put a little plug in for ARCS, the Association of Registrars and Collections Specialists. We are now five years old and um, deal with some of the same issues that MCN has dealt with in the past. But I'm wondering if we shouldn't have a joint conference the way we used to at MCN when there was a, we'd sort of work with another group and have one day of overlapping conference. I remember we did that in D.C., we did that in San Diego, um, we've did, done it other places too. But I think, I think it's time for MCN and ARCS to have a, a, a joint, not joint conference, but an overlapping conference because some of the issues for us um, are the same. Um, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. I like the idea. We used to do some of that back yeah. in the day too. That we would that we would um, that we would have some overlap with some other. We had some overlap with the visual BRA. We had some overlap yeah. with some of the others. Um, I think it's helpful just even just in general for ma- for just in the profession just for arranging travel. Um, extending your time back on that, I think, is easier on budgets um, for some And the vendors' and, budgets, too. You know, and on the vendors' easy. budgets as well. I think that that's we, true. We don't have a, um, uh, we don't have a, what do they call them, a marketplace um, where the vendors can set up their things and everything. We don't have anything like that, but we offer little tables for the information. And the, the vendors uh, are also able to speak at our conferences and um uh, for example, one of our upcoming um, uh, sessions in November is going to be a, a comparison of four different apps that people use for doing condition reports, and I think that will be very, very interesting. Um, we did this two years ago where uh, one of the vendors uh, talked about their app, and uh, now we're not going to have vendors talk about the apps. We're going to have people who actually use them to do condition reports. And um, are, are you doing? Uh, are you using apps to do, or uh, like an iPad to, do, or some kind of a tablet to do condition reports at PMA? So our registrars have been have been working on this, and, and uh-huh. we've been helping them kind of get. Um, we've been helping them get that going. I think that there's so they don't they're not using a specific app. They're using. Um, what they're doing is that they're saving condition reports, um, those condition reports out of TMS, and they're annotating them on an iPad, and uh-huh. then being able to push those back. And I think some of that that they would like to see, um, especially for their condition reports, is is um, and TMS has done this now to, to more a, a little bit better remote access to TMS and to that function inside that. And I think uh-huh. so. I think they they're sort of going back and forth between an app that's specific for that information that then has to find its way back to the object record or um, trying to find a way to directly put that back into TMS um, by using the TMS remote. So yes, the answer, short answer to your question is yes, we are, and we're doing it in a couple of different ways. That's great. That's great. I hope that your your, um, methodology will be represented at the ARCS conference. So I'm wondering... So what was your... um, before we get before we get away from that, what was what's your memory, your oh, MCN I have, memory? I have so many. I remember, um, I really liked the um, the auction where people brought things okay. from their museum shops, and um, I remember somebody. I think it was Kathy Jones who won a cheese head hat one year. Somebody from Wisconsin brought a cheese head hat. <laughs> And I remember some, I think it was Kathy who won it. I, I, I'm not 100% sure. And I also remember, um, I don't, rem- I think Robert Lemming was president then, but we all went to, I think it was a decommissioned church which became a beer bar. I, I don't know whether it was Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, but I remember flights and flights and flights of different beers on the table, and they were just beautiful, the different colors of beer. <laughs> I, I wasn't a, much of a beer drinker, but I thought it was really um a very happy occasion. (laughs) Um, I also bought for my institution when I was at Detroit Institute of Arts um, a huge volume set. I think it was nomenclature or maybe, no, it was was a dictionary of some sort or an encyclopedia of some sort that had like 17 volumes and I won it for like $10 and gave it to my library and they were thrilled. So um, those are are sort of the... um, social memories rather than the sessions. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. That's yeah, that sounds like that sounds like great fun. I like the um I like the idea of doing beer flights in a in a in an old church. 
<laughs> it was decommissioned, I'm quite sure. <laughs> I'm sure, but it, uh, I think that would, that's a nice setting for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, we've been going on for just about a half an hour, and I don't know that anybody's going to listen to a half-hour-long discussion between the two of us. Shall we say thank you for this opportunity to uh, NCN? Yes, I think so. The only, the, if you want to, the only thing that I think, and we don't have to be three, maybe it could just be one, um, to end it with the um, advice that we give somebody trying to start out, because I think oh, maybe yeah. that far, I think that oh. might actually be something we have, that maybe we have something valuable to say, that they can wait till the end and get something valuable. Well, what, would, what advice would you give? Um, so that's, so people ask, and we actually, we have an intern program here in the summer, and so, so and that primarily that's the question they ask. They want to know how they can work here. And I think really for me the, the, the advice is, and sort of the advice that I've had for myself as I've worked through this, is that um, the reason that I do this work is, is that um, I love the environment. I'm surrounded by people who are, are singularly dedicated to and love the work that they do. And I think that that environment um, is rich, and it's and it has been a rich experience throughout my career to to be um, to be around people like that. And I think mm-hmm. that you, I think, when you come to this, I think you need to understand um, that it is a lot about um, it's a lot about the work that you do, but it's also a lot about where you, you know you really have to be caring about where you do it. You have to you have to really like where you're doing it, because um, otherwise, especially in technical work, you can do technical work anywhere. Um, yeah. But it is singular. That experience is singular. I think in in museums and um, and if you can, if you do like the people and the environment, it's a career that you can enjoy for a variety of reasons. And and if you don't, um, my suggestion would be to find a different place to do technology work. Ah, interesting. Um, I think my uh, my recommendation is more um, broad than that, um, than, than discussion of technology. It's, it's um, whatever somebody is interested in, <clears throat> in doing to really explore it and to be willing to um, follow your heart, basically. Follow, follow those leads that take you to, um, to learn more about what you might be interested in. Sometimes your interests change, and um, I would say take every opportunity. If it means spending a little bit extra of your money to go to a conference where you're not necessarily supported by another institution, spend the money and go. Um, get engaged, volunteer, um, and then I think, um, I, I mean, I hope that people will find the jobs that are the best for, suited for their personalities and their interests, but um, I also realize that um, museum studies programs are churning out people who may or may not be able to find jobs, but be willing to go someplace that isn't a major city. Um, be expect to, that you're that you'll be changing jobs um, uh, through the course of your career. Um, at least that's what's happened to me, and I've been very satisfied for the past 12 years doing my work on on my own, uh, developing clients and their collections and. Uh, and um, enjoying what I do, and that's the key. If you don't enjoy what you're doing, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, you should find something else, take a risk, and move to something else. So that's sort of my advice. Okay, I agree. So thanks, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill, and congratulations on your 20 years there. That's, uh, that's wonderful, and uh, nice to learn that you have two kids whose favorite colors are yellow and blue. <laughs> And then it's honored in the sky. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. And uh, let's see. Let's hope that MCN has another 50 years in it. Um, I'm sure it has. God knows what it'll be like in 50 years. 